In the winter of 2002, the World Health Organization was notified of a mysterious respiratory illness emerging in the Chinese province of Guangdong. The initial symptoms were similar to those for flu, but soon developed into a dry cough and difficulty in breathing. Some patients would develop severe damage to their lungs and eventually die. When you are infected by a virus, very often you have some very classical clinical signs such as uh, fever and uh, pain in your muscles and you are tired and this is absolutely classical and many different viruses can uh, give this clinical presentation so they are absolutely not specific for, for, for a virus or another. Nobody knew what this disease was and most importantly what was causing it. But it would soon become a global public health alert. There are several very large groups of viruses that can be spread by, uh, via aerosol droplets. Uh, many of these will of course come under the heading of respiratory viruses. This is an extremely efficient way of spreading viruses. Probably the most efficient of all. A doctor in Guangzhou was treating a patient who had fallen ill with what was thought of as an atypical form of pneumonia. The doctor became infected himself. Shortly afterwards, he travelled to Hong Kong, where he stayed at an international hotel. This one person was enough to infect many more people staying in the same hotel. One of the big problems is that we all travel with the speed of a jet of an airplane. So within 10 hours actually, the, the virus that, that infects a human being, let's say in Hong Kong, within 10 to 11 hours, arrives in Frankfurt. As the newly infected people started traveling back to their home countries, the worldwide epidemic began. The new disease would become known as the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. Or SARS. A very high proportion of virus infections um, are not diagnosed, not because of um, the lack of uh, technology uh, or capability, but it's mo mainly down to money. There just isn't the infrastructure. The electron microscope is the only convenient tool that scientists have to look at viruses in their host cells. At the time of the SARS outbreak, scientists took samples of cells infected by the virus and inserted them into the electron microscope, which has a magnification power of around 100,000. Through an electron microscope, the general shape and size of a virus can be seen, and sometimes the family of viruses can be identified. On March 24, 2003, it was announced by the press that three independent laboratories funded by the WHO, uh, the World Health Organization, had discovered that the pathogenic agent causing SARS was coronavirus. When I was teaching to the medical students here in Leuven in uh, October and November on coronaviruses, I was explaining that coronaviruses was sort of a common cause. Now, two months later, Suddenly, we were confronted with SARS, and then we learned that SARS was a coronavirus. The coronaviridae were known as a family of viruses that mainly infect animals. There are many more viruses infecting animals rather than humans. This is partly because many of these viruses evolved before humans appeared on Earth. Because these viruses have adapted to their original hosts, they generally do not cause any significant harm to them. But occasionally, some of these viruses cross the species barrier, for instance from birds to humans. As the human has never seen this virus before, and the virus has not yet adapted to its new host, the chances are much higher that this virus will cause a devastating disease. 
SARS was a newly emerging virus. It had never been seen in humans before. Worldwide, the SARS epidemic caused some 774 deaths. There was no vaccination program or drugs. There was no known cure for SARS. The SARS epidemic killed hundreds, but compared to major pandemics, it was relatively harmless. In 1918, the Spanish flu had devastating effects on the entire world. It caused more than 20 million deaths worldwide. Within a few months, it killed more people than the First World War. A virus is effectively a blueprint, like a piece of genetic information that's wrapped up in a protein, rather like a person having a coat on. Um, this genetic blueprint can be either RNA or it can be DNA. It's never both. What is special in viruses is that they are able to replicate, but to replicate they need a host. They cannot replicate by themselves alone. Bacteria can do that. Many bacteria can replicate uh, alone if you give them a few nutrients, but viruses cannot. Viruses have to uh, infect a cell. Since viruses spread through the hosts they infect, modern phenomena like the effects of global warming, the ease of traveling, and the dramatic increase in the number and density of the human population on this planet offer viruses new opportunities to spread every day. As a result, viruses causing gastroenteritis, measles, influenza, meningitis, and others such as the Ebola, Japanese encephalitis, dengue fever, and West Nile viruses kill millions of people every year. What all these viruses have in common is that they are RNA viruses. So if you have to draw the picture of uh, the future uh, emerging virus, it's something quite dangerous. But there is a very high probability that it will be an RNA virus and that it will come from a, an animal reservoir. The amazing thing with SARS is that, in fact, we were in the same situation when the outbreak arrived as in the 17th, 18th century with the plague where they had to anchor ships outside to have quarantine. In SARS, the only treatment was quarantine because there was no antiviral drugs against SARS. There was indeed antibiotics were useless and the only antiviral which was known was probably also useless. So quarantine and rest was the only possibility Sauce, and we want to change it. In the year 2000, Christian Cambio initiated the Vizier project. Vizier is one of our integrated projects in the field of structural genomics. This project is, is unique in terms of uh, scientific knowledge and also in terms of international collaboration. Uh, we are putting together 25 different partners from many countries in Europe which are experts in structural biology, molecular biology, bioinformatics and virology, studying viruses. So we are putting together different expertises to make something bigger, something that couldn't be achieved by a single lab in a single country. By the year 2003, over 20 top laboratories throughout Europe began to work together on what is the largest structural genomics program on viruses to date. Leading experts from various disciplines were gathered to fight a real threat to human health. The RNA viruses. So within Vizier, there are several groups, and uh, one of the important groups is a group of virologists. And these people are supposed to uh, collect viruses, grow these viruses, and prepare these viruses, purify these viruses.
within this year, more than 300 viruses listed. And um, these viruses, for some of them, are already in some laboratories of the collaborators of this year. But some of these viruses are not in our laboratories, so we have to collect them from uh, the environment, or from, from patients sometimes, or to collect them from other uh, teams in Europe. I'm a virologist. I've worked in Oxford now for um, nearly 20 years. And over that period of time, I've collected a very large number of viruses. I've got hundreds of viruses in my freezers. And some of my friends that are also on VISI have done the same thing. Between us, we've built up a collection, enormous collection of RNA viruses. We can also produce large quantities. So what we have, we have stocks of each of these viruses, high quality stocks. Each one is carefully labeled, it's banked in the freezers, and we can go back to it many times to the same one. We can keep going back, we can keep reproducing the same results. So these very large collections become our archival collections, and they are effectively biodiverse libraries, genetic libraries, if you like, for, for today and for the future. The more we know on a virus family, the more chances that we will have a drug on a potentially emerging virus and a non virus. So, the, the basic concept of this is to work on as many viruses as we can. So, we can actually speed up things on unknown viruses and viruses that are dangerous but that have not been studied enough. SARS appeared when a strain of coronavirus crossed the species barrier and mutated in such a way that it could spread from human to human. This is exactly what might happen with bird flu. Because unlike DNA viruses, RNA viruses such as the influenza have the ability to evolve rapidly by mutating. That's how they can adjust quickly to their new hosts. In fact, many RNA viruses can evolve millions of times faster than the host they infect, which makes vaccination and drug design very difficult. The principle of vaccination is to allow you to uh, mount rapidly uh, a specific immunological response against uh, a pathogen that you have been immunized for. If you have not been vaccinated before, your immunological response will take uh, one or two weeks to develop. If you are immunized before, then it will take only a few days. In some cases, vaccination is not sufficient. So we still continue to see a lot of people dying of rabies everywhere in the world, although there is a vaccine available. So it means that in some cases, vaccines are not available to some human population because of their price, because of the way they need to be stored, or reasons like this. So we need other products that will be directly effective to the replicating viruses in the body. One of the greatest scientific discoveries of the 20th century was the discovery of antibiotics. It revolutionized medical care. As a result of the development of antibiotics, today we have the means to fight bacterial infections. Why don't we have that for viruses? Studying viruses in the past has been very difficult. A virus is so small that an electron microscope only reveals its general shape and size. So what is inside? DNA viruses contain only DNA. RNA viruses contain only RNA. RNA is genetic material, like DNA. In a living cell, the genetic material is DNA. Genetic material is like a code, which is carried in the form of four building blocks. These are called nucleotides, and are represented by the letters A, C, G and T. RNA is also genetic material, but instead of T, it contains U. So why are genetic material and nucleotides so important for life? because each three-letter combination of nucleotides, K, 
codes for a different amino acid. Proteins are made of amino acids. So genetic material is like a code because it serves as the blueprint for the creation of proteins. This is a vital to life process as proteins are the building blocks of life. Every virus has a unique sequence. For example, yellow fever virus has a unique code, dengue virus has a unique code, SARS virus has a unique code. In the past, virologists had to use very basic methods to characterize their viruses. They used antigenic methods, and they basically used to look down microscopes and, and say, well, it looks, it looks as though it's probably the virus that we say it is. Now today, we can determine the absolute identity of any virus um, because we can determine its genetic code, we can sequence it. With sequencing, the scientists can determine all the nucleotides of the viral genome in their exact order. It's like a, a, say a book with a special order of the letters in the book. and You have to determine very precisely the, this order to have the sequence. This is the perfect identification. Viruses need hosts to replicate. They need the cells of a living organism. When a virus like dengue enters the human body, it will find its way into the type of cells it's customized to infect. In this case, a type of white blood cell. Our cells are constantly at work, maintaining the viability of the organism. If cells cannot perform their specific functions, the organism will suffer. The virus enters the cell and soon after it loses its protective coat. The viral RNA is released. Now the virus is ready to hijack the cell and force it to work exclusively for its own replication. The viral RNA is like a blueprint and as soon as the ribosomes of the cell start scanning it, a long chain of amino acids called the polyprotein is produced. This polyprotein is useless until it is split into its individual components. Each of these components is a viral protein with a specific and essential function for the new viruses. One of them, for example, cleaves the polyprotein to produce individual viral proteins. The most important of these viral proteins, the polymerase, which has the shape of a hand, will then make copies of the viral RNA. This process forces the cell to become a factory for producing new viral RNA and more viral proteins, both of which are necessary for the assembly of many new viruses. The new viruses, after they form buds and leave the cell, will in turn infect new cells. The cell is left damaged, sometimes even destroyed, and the host could fall ill or even die. From one single virus, within hours, thousands of new viruses can be produced. VZA stands for Viral Enzymes Involved in Replication. We started the, the VZA program working on the replication machinery of viruses because it was, as we said, a validated target. We know that if we kill the replication machinery of the viruses, we would get a drug active against viruses. If we look at the biosphere as a whole and count the number of organisms in it, there are a huge number of viruses. If we take, for instance, a drop of water, we find that there are, at least in order of magnitude, more viruses than all other forms of life put together. Viruses permeate the entire biosphere. They are parasitic upon every form of life. They're incredibly successful and phenomenally diverse. So where do we start? It was a very important finding uh, that um, viruses which belong to the same uh, virus family, they have similarities. It opened door to the hope that we develop a strategy to combat wars of uh, this class. We may uh, be well prepared to combat other wars of the same class. 
A virus hides inside the cell, and in order for a drug to destroy that virus without destroying the cell itself, the scientists must identify unique components of that virus that do not exist in the cell, such as the viral polymerase. That's the task of bioinformaticians at the second stage of the Vizier pipeline. Now the sequence of the virus will be used to discover the proteins involved in the replication of this virus. This is possible through a technique called sequence alignment, in which viral genomes and the proteins they code for are compared. Since genomes of viruses and their proteins can be represented by letters, it's like establishing similarities between texts. When you read uh, foreign poetry and you would like to understand it, uh, you could use dictionary or translation. When you read proteins or polynucleotides, there is no translation, there is no dictionary. And the only way to understand this, you have to compare text. If two different viruses have significantly similar genomes, then it can be predicted that their proteins will also have a similar structure and function. Sasha Gobelenia and his team are predicting the regions of the proteins that are essential for replication. But this is only the beginning. Customized drug design is not possible until the scientists can work with a three-dimensional model of this protein. They need the protein's molecular structure. During the last year, we really realized, and uh, this is now uh, become something obvious, that we need structure to, to design and to optimize drugs. And structure uh, really became something uh, really uh, indispensable for uh, drug design and drug optimization. And the, the real purpose of the VZ project is on this structural determination. So in the Vizier project, we're particularly interested in enzymes which drive replication, copying of the genetic material of the virus. So most of the proteins we're going to be working on are enzymes which have this particular function. The next step in the Vizier pipeline is protein production. In order for the three-dimensional structure of a protein to be determined, the scientists have to first make and isolate this protein in the lab. The traditional way to make proteins for structural analysis is to take the gene for the protein from the virus and put it into a bacteria and then use the bacteria as a factory to make the protein. But if you take a protein like SARS proteins made in an alien cell and you try and make those proteins in bacteria, bacteria are not very good at it. The strategy of Vizio in terms of the protein production, goes through a series of processes. One tries the uh, easy route with bacteria first, and then we have to have a backup systems which are more complex, where we try and get the protein made in cells that are closer to the cell that the virus will be. As the task of the protein production is a series of time-consuming experiments, it is mainly divided between two of Vizier's highest technology labs, the AFMB in Marseille and the OPPF in Oxford. Where Vizier comes in is to really try and make this successful um, with viruses. We can get high throughput, but we've still got work to develop the methods to give us high output. So now we have new tools study viruses and then it's a new era for the study of virology because we are going to use all the technology and the scientific efforts that has been done before. The discovery of X-rays more than a century ago put in motion a series of technological developments. Today we can illuminate with high intensity X-ray radiation something as small as a protein molecule. In effect, X-ray crystallography is the most reliable method that scientists can use to get a three-dimensional image of the isolated and purified protein molecules. The only problem is, they also need crystals. Crystallography is the only tool we can use to produce accurate structures. 
and without crystals, you can't do crystallography. So you could say that the success of Italy depends on crystallization states. It's vital. When seawater collects in a rock pool and the water evaporates, salt crystals remain. A salt crystal is created by a regular arrangement of salt molecules in space. In the case of protein crystals, the protein molecule repeats in space in such a way as to form a crystal. So a, a diamond on your finger is very large, but a crystal that we put in a finger drawing is much, much smaller. But the size is important because the bigger the crystal, the easier it is to collect data. So one of the technical things that's happening in crystallography is that we've had more powerful synchrotrons so that we can deal with smaller and smaller crystals. A synchrotron storage ring carries electrons traveling close to the speed of light. These electrons generate an intense source of X-rays that can be used to illuminate crystals of biological molecules such as proteins. Now a crystal is made up of many molecules, all in the same orientation. So instead of looking at the scattering from one molecule, we're looking at the scattering of millions and millions of molecules. And so we have an enormous amplification Some proteins are globular. The more globular they are, the easier it is to crystallize them. But pro polymerases, for instance, that has this hand form with fingers and thumbs, they are more, more difficult. When we get crystals, we always get extremely excited because uh, there's always a lot of effort before we come there. And uh, we know that when we get something that is crystalline, then we get a pro the destruction. We have crystals? Yes. Ah! Wow. Oh, no, the virus is Get it in the beam. Yep. Yeah. There's a diffraction. No, no. Having the structure of a viral protein is imperative for designing an effective drug against that virus. We have old antivirals which uh, would not make it today on the market. But because they were designed 30 years ago and we had virtually nothing, we are still using these antivirals. For example, the ribavirin is an old molecule was discovered 30 years ago, is active on many viruses but has some big side adverse effects. Designing and making effective antiviral drugs that will not have adverse side effects is an extremely costly and time-consuming process for any pharmaceutical company. In the past, the most severe viral infections were found in developing countries which were not a good market for often expensive pharmaceuticals. But things are slowly changing because some of these countries are becoming potential markets and some of these infections are spreading to the developed world. If you would be able to design a certain object that would fit perfectly in one of the parts of the engine, and would stop the engine from running. That's about what we do. We would like to do with the virus. Design, a compound, an object that fits perfectly into this engine of the virus and makes this virus to stop replicating. Validation is the last step of the Vizier pipeline. In this stage, all the previous research is put to use 
for the ultimate goal of finding neat compounds that will stop the replication of the virus, or better still, a family of viruses. In the Rega Institute, we have about 25,000 original compounds. We can test these compounds against a various number of viruses. And once we have identified a number of compounds, we can try to confirm whether these compounds are indeed active against that or that, or that virus. <coughs> so if we identify a compound that is, for example, active against a yellow fever virus, it's quite likely that this compound, with a little bit of optimization, will also be active against dengue or West Nile. That's, that's, that's something. If you can design a drug against one virus, chances are that if there is one emerging pathogen of the same family, the drug will work. At the time of the SARS outbreak, Rolf Hildenfeld and his team were working on a SARS-related virus of which they had already solved the protein structure. What we have done in the case of SARS, through our previous work on the related viruses, which brought us in a position to react very quickly and come up with the potential drugs within weeks after the identification of the virus. I think this is a model for what Vizier hopes to and will achieve for many other viruses. These projects are not uh, directly designing the antiviral drugs. They are making all the necessary steps before. Science is a very risky business. It's a very long-term uh, business. So they have to be prepared. So whenever a new outbreak, a new strain arrives, somebody else will use the information and the technologies developed by, by Vizier in order to get the right solution to the right problem as fast as possible. All this information, which is gathered from many different labs, will be uh, stored and uh, analyzed in databases that are going to be available to the scientific community. The Vizia project will last for four years. During this time, the scientists hope to establish the technologies, infrastructure and knowledge necessary to fight current and future viral infections. Will it be enough? We are just at the beginning of the story. Anyway. We are in, in, in the situation of uh, antibiotics for bacteria. 50 years ago, that's all. We are at the very beginning. We have to have the breadth of knowledge across all viruses. It's impossible to know where the next threat will be. As long as nothing happens, I mean, you feel safe. Nobody really feels threatened by viruses. And then SARS happens and make people realize that it could happen any time and it can happen again with another virus. This is where viruses are terrifying. We don't have to go very far back. And HIV didn't exist. It emerged from nowhere. And then not to forget, we have the flu, the bird flu virus that has the potential to become a pandemic virus, a virus that may cause millions and millions of deaths. If there is an epidemic, it's too late. You can't just produce a drug overnight. It takes time. We can't just wait on industry to, to produce these things. Like academics have a, a role that they can play here as well. So RNA viruses are definitely a threat for the future. And we should now prepare for the next 5, 10, 20, 50, perhaps 100 years.